uh, we've had to adjust to the pandemic as same as everyone else. And uh, so we have a very different approach to this year's uh, uh, fall meet, including an online presentation uh, for the Saturday evening event. And we also, uh, the theme for this year was to observe the uh, 30th anniversary of the Last Mountain Bird Observatory. So that's why uh, we combined it with uh, field visits at the, at the site today as well and tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, that's what you'll be hearing about tonight. Um, before we start though, I just wanna let you know about a few housekeeping items to be aware of. Uh, it's like any other meeting, you have to go over a few things uh, at the beginning uh, for the venue, but it's a different type of venue, so different types of housekeeping items. Uh, the first thing we'd ask is that people mute themselves. It looks as if uh, most everyone has done that, but if you're not familiar with the mute control, there's uh, one button down in the lower left part of your Zoom screen, and if you could mute, you, mute yourself, there will be less uh, interruption uh, uh, and uh, just, just, just general uh, disruption. And the same thing about the video signal. You can uh, hit stop video as well uh, that way. And um, if, if you're not uh, muted, uh, Alan may do that for you during the course as well. So uh, we'll see that. Uh, but I did want to mention there will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation this evening. Uh, you can type your question in the chat screen at the bottom. That should be showing on your, your Zoom screen as well. And uh, Jordan is uh, monitoring those here and will be moder moderating them and uh, there will be a chance to pass them on to Al at the end. Uh, you should also know we will be recording this event uh, this evening uh, because uh, uh, we wanna make it available for people who weren't able to join this evening, maybe didn't have a good internet connection or something like that. So the whole thing is being recorded, will be recorded and uh, made available later. Uh, and Ellen, our, uh, our meeting manager, will be monitoring the chat as well for uh, any technical issues. If you're running into any problems, uh, you can uh, again uh, indicate that in the chat and uh, that will be monitored and hopefully we can help you out. And one other tip for viewing in the upper right uh, uh, corner of your Zoom screen, you can toggle between gallery view or speaker view. And you probably want to have it set to speaker view for the best uh, experience of the presentation. Uh, so as I said, we're going to be talking about uh, Last Mountain Bird Observatory this evening. And uh, to do that, we're going to hear from Al Smith, who has been uh, really a guiding light and, and a great influence and great developer of the Bird Observatory through its entire life. Um, He'll be saying a lot about it, so I won't, I won't mention too much, but just to put it in a little beginning perspective, uh, the LMBO is the only Saskatchewan monitoring station in the Canadian Migration Monitoring Network, so it's very significant that way, substantial uh, thing for us to have. And uh, since 1990, there have been over 70,000 birds banded there, uh, representing 115 species, so it, it's been... Uh, uh, very successful operation, a uh, huge amount of banding and monitoring going on. Um, so I'd like to turn to that uh, and introduce this evening's speaker, Al Smith. And uh, Al is someone who's had a lifelong interest in birds. He can trace it back to his youngest ages. And uh, he's done field work with birds going back to his university days. And this led to a 37 year career with the Canadian Wildlife Service. Uh, very, very successful career. He has wide experience, of course, here in the prairies, but he's also worked a lot in the Arctic. And he's worked with uh, neotropical land birds in Costa Rica and Venezuela as well. Uh, he's been responsible for many publications, uh, including the first Atlas of Saskatchewan Birds back in the mid 90s and uh, many popular publications to help, uh, to help birders uh, among the general populace. And maybe most important to us recently, uh, he's been, the, he was the lead editor and, and huge contributor to the very successful publication of Birds of Saskatchewan last year by our organization, Nature Saskatchewan. Uh, he's been the recipient of many awards. So I'll just mention one that I think uh, especially stands out. It's the Ludlow Griscom Award by the American Birding Association. It recognizes an individual who has dramatically advanced the state of birding in a particular region. 
And uh, related to this evening's topic, uh, he was instrumental in the founding of Last Mountain Bird Observatory and has been a driving force in its work ever since. So uh, lots to uh, speak about with, with Al, but uh, I will turn it over to him now to give this evening's presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks for the uh, wonderful introduction, Ed. Um, yeah, actually, Last Mountain, the first banding at Last Mountain Bird Observatory occurred in 1989. It was uh, an idea that was coming of age, an idea that we needed to do something to monitor those birds that breathe in the boreal forest and winter in the in the tropical areas. And these areas are not very well monitored by the Breeding Bird Survey or other things because the, the, the north is remote and the tropics are remote or can be dangerous or expensive to go to. So the idea was that we, we would set up banding stations to capture the birds as they migrated from the Arctic, from the boreal forest to the tropics in the spring and the fall. So, and why did we want to study this group of birds? It's because of habitat loss, both in the boreal forest and in the tropics. And that's why we thought it would be a good idea to put a banding station on the prairie because most of the birds that are migrating through the prairie don't nest there. They're coming from further north in the, in the fall. And so we thought a, a station that was out in the bald prairie would be a good site if and only if it was a migrant trap. In other words, it had to be an area that tended to concentrate the birds. And, and so in the fall of 1989, under the encouragement of Tony Diamond, we set out to find a place that we thought might be good to capture these birds. So we tried a few places. Uh, we tried uh, Nicola Flats at near Buffalo Pound Lake. We found Weyburn, but it was more intuition than science that we hit upon Last Mountain Regional Park. It seemed perfect. If you know anything about mist netting, and mist netting is part of the banding process, is that you put a net along a hedgerow. Well, Last Mountain Regional Park is all hedgerows and they're in perfect lines and you just have to put your net up there and don't have to cut any trees or any pathways through, it's all set up. And so we, we tried for two weeks in August, 1989 and caught so many birds in that short period that we thought, I think we've got a spot. So in 1990, we uh, started a full-fledged, pun intended, um, banding effort. And we did this by setting up 13 mist nets and, uh, and developing a two kilometer uh, census route. And so uh, with that, uh, Last Mountain Bird Observatory, excuse me, Observatory was born. And uh, from then on, we uh, began to monitor birds by uh, opening the mist nets for six hours a day in May, in the spring, and in the fall, in August, September, and early October. And that way we would catch the birds as they migrate. And also for those birds that we not readily caught in the mist nets, we, put a, we uh, did a census route as well. So um, over the years, we gathered information and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ed Roger mentioned that we had caught, uh, I think 75,000 birds of 115 species. Well, that's a little old data, but we're getting towards 100,000 now, and we've banded 120 species. Now, people will say, well, so what? You know, they caught a lot of birds. What have, you, what have you found out? And good question. You know, banding birds 
is only good for catching birds that nest in the area because if you're catching migrants, your, your chances of catching that bird again are very remote. So I won't kid people by saying we've had a lot of banned recoveries, very few. Out of the 90,000 birds we banned, we maybe have 20 recoveries. Now we have learned a lot about birds that nest locally because they tend to come back to the same spot. And we have some really good data on birds that nest locally. In fact, if you get enough data, you can do an actuarial table to see what if the population is maintaining itself in that particular area. We also have the world's record's oldest yellow warbler and brown thrasher. Yellow warbler, I think, was 11 years. And um, I forget about the brown thrasher. Anyway, these are very, we've learned a lot about locally nesting birds with banding. But there are many other things that we've learned at Last Mountain Bird Observatory over the years. Um, we've added several species to the provincial bird list. We caught the very first Townsend warbler, first, first confirmed record, first confirmed record of uh, uh, the blue gray gnat catcher, and there's only been two other records since. Uh, the uh, first and only record of Cassin's Vireo and the first and only record of northern wheat ear, which is a bird that nests in a far northern Canada. Um, among the other things we've learned is, uh, is uh, population trends. Um, over the course of these 30 years of banding, we've uh, gathered the data, which is analyzed by Birds Canada, used to be called Bird Studies Canada, and looked at you know, trends of populations. And there are trends available. There are some species that are declining and there are some species that are increasing in numbers. So from that standpoint, been a real success. Um, other things we're looking at are uh, migration strategies. We can tell whether or not a bird coming into the Last Mountain Bird Observatory is using the site as a refueling station or as a rest stop. In other words, some species want to come into the Last Mountain Bird Observatory. They've evolved that over, over centuries, I guess. They, they come in to refuel. Other species that go through the area only land in inclement weather. So they only use it when they have to use it. And another group of birds, avoids going across the prairies any, entirely, and so we don't catch them. Uh, birds like black throated green, war green warblers are quite rare at Last Mountain Bird Observatory. The theory is with those species, they fly around the prairies. They go through uh, uh, Saskatchewan into Manitoba through the interlake and go that way and totally avoiding the prairie. Uh, we lo we're looking at phenology. And, is climate change occurring? Is it causing birds to migrate earlier in the spring and later in the fall? And we have found, you know, some interesting information in that regard as well. Um, both in terms of migration uh, trends, uh, population trends, and in terms of phenology, you really need a long timeline to develop these trends. And of course, at 30 years old, um, we're just starting to get that kind of data because it takes a long time to to really uh, see what the trends are and are they more are they cyclical or are they long term trends? Um, another uh, high tech uh, thing that we use is what they call uh, stable isotope work. In other words, we take a feather and analyze the uh, ratio of deuterium in that feather. And that's a signature that reflects the origin geographically in terms of, uh, in terms of latitude of, of where the bird's from. In other words, a bird growing its feathers as an adult in the molt or as a young bird in the nest is uh, reflective of the deuterium ratio in that um, geographic band. So we've been able to determine, for instance, that a palm warblers that we catch at Last Mountain Birds are bird observatory come mainly from the Northwest Territories, even though they nest from the Alaska 
to uh, northern Alberta and Saskatchewan. We know from the isotopes that those particular birds that we're catching, those particular palm warblers are coming from uh, the Northwest Territories. So that's how uh, isotopes work uh, and fascinating stuff. Uh, we're looking at, uh, of course, uh, 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 things like uh, um, um, like uh, MOTUS is another thing that's just come online. MOTUS is a cooperative uh, use of, uh, of uh, telemetry data across all coordinated so that anybody that puts a uh, radio transmitter on a bird in any part of Canada is uh, part of the MOTUS. If they're part of the MOTUS system, that bird is tracked by receivers that are put across um, the um, uh, length and breadth of North America and throughout the world, actually. And those motor stations can track through a cooperative agreement uh, of any bird migrating through a particular area. So you don't have to have receivers all over the place. You have receivers on site to uh, to record these birds as they migrate. And so uh, this is a real important high-tech solution to the problem of banding because you just don't catch that many uh, birds and to make things uh, worthwhile. So um, we're really happy about MODIS being uh, uh, established at Last Mountain Bird Story as well. Um, what else can I talk about here? Um, Yeah, I should say too that you know the data from Last Mountain Bird Sorry is uh, being used by researchers across North America. We just had, for instance, a request for data of all our black pole warbler banding data and looking at wing length of the birds and to see whether or not wing length influences the, the way they migrate because the theory is that the longer the wing, the further you can migrate. So they wanted to look at the wing length of of the black pole warblers to determine where they might be coming from because black pole warblers have a very interesting story and they uh, they migrate across the Bermuda Triangle in the fall and uh, uh, they fly non-stop from the eastern seaboard of the United States to northern South America a flight of 18 hours or more. These birds put on a tremendous amount of fat uh, before they leave this eastern seaboard and going from about 11 grams in weight to about 17 grams. So if you do the math, um, a bird can fly about 10 hours on a gram of fat, so you can get an idea of just how long they're migrating. And these are the sorts of fascinating stories that we're learning through banding and isotopes and uh, telemetry and uh, even things called uh, uh, geolocators, which are uh, a fancy way of uh, they record the, the position of the sun and the time and you can actually um, using uh, this um, uh, gizmo of determine what the uh, route that the bird is taking its migration. The problem with those uh, that uh, uh, thing is you have to get the bird back and download the data from the uh, geolocator. But you know so technology is just tremendous in the way that things are uh, have unfolded in terms of, of our understanding of the, the migration of birds. So we're so glad that Nature Saskatchewan has taken the bird of the story under its wing and that we're having a, a good uh, uh, succession from my, uh, I haven't been there for four years. Um, Jordan uh, uh, Rustad uh, uh, has uh, taken over the, uh, as the uh, uh, banding uh, bander in charge, and uh, so she wasn't even born when we started in 1990. So it's a it's a great thing to see. So uh, after uh, with uh, further ado, I can throw the uh, floor, I guess we'd call it, or the you know, computer screen open to questions. Hello. Did you get any questions, Jordan? 
Yeah, I've got a couple that we'll start with and then hopefully other people will uh, send some in on the chat or we can uh, open up their mics if we have to. Um, I, you may have answered this out, but uh, I'll give you an opportunity to just put it in those words again. The question was, why is it important to track the migration of birds? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think it's important that, to track the migration of birds because um, in this day and age of climate change and all kinds of other upheavals like fires and other, it's good to know what changes are occurring. You know, what uh, are the migra is the migration being affected by climate change? Um, are, are there uh, things happening in the migration system that uh, are new? For instance, uh, we're seeing a lot more birds winter in Saskatchewan that never wintered here before. Are they um, wintering further north? Um, other aspects of uh, migration that are interesting to find out too is uh, wh what what are the age and sex ratios of the birds? At what, what is their timing? For instance, we know that in the spring, the first back birds are back are the adult males they that are more than one year old and then the young males that are uh, just born last year come and then the, the the adult females and then the young females so with banding we we can determine those kinds of interesting things that we really had no idea were were occurring um next question one is what was the rarest bird that's been banded at the station uh, the rarest bird was the, well, in terms of Saskatchewan, was the Cassin's Vireo, which we caught in the mist net. Oh, God, I forget the date of it, but, um, yeah, it was in the spring. It, Cassin's Vireo is very similar to uh, uh, a blue-headed vireo. In fact, they used to be called the same species, but now they're... Uh, separated out, and this is the first record of the Cassin's Vireo in Saskatchewan. It's not that, doesn't breed that far away. It's more of a, a bird of the uh, western mountains, north to southern BC, that area. So it, it wasn't that far off, off the uh, beaten path. Okay. Um, what's your favorite bird? The person asking said their favorite is a cedar waxwing. Oh, yeah. Well, my favorite bird is a Frugian's hawk, which is a big raptor. We've never caught one at the banding station, fortunately. It would wreck in this net, but I used to band them in Alberta. And uh, yeah, they're my favorite bird. Um, really not a songbird, shall we say, but uh, certainly a, a wonderful bird, a, a bird that's very important to this Canadian prairie ecosystem because it eats a lot of ground squirrels. Uh, this is a question from somebody who is out at the, visiting the station today and they're asking what types of nests are visible on the island and I'm wondering if the question is more just what effect on the island. Oh, yeah, on Coney Island? Yeah, that would probably um, be where they were looking out across yeah. that. Well, we've had an interesting uh, bunch of birds have nested there over the years. Uh, great blue herons have nested there, cormorants, double crested cormorants. Um, about six years ago, there was a few pairs of great egrets nested there, which is only about the third or fourth nesting record of the species in the, in the province. So, you know, probably what they're seeing is great blue heron nests in the main. Mm -hmm. That's all the, the questions that have come in right now. If anyone else has uh, some questions that they would like to still uh, type in or uh, if you don't sort of find the chat, take yourself off mute and you can ask Al the question directly. We'll give that a minute or two. I, I should mention that uh, I don't know if I mentioned that before, but we have our data that's being sent all across North America 
uh, with researchers and uh, and also the uh, the data from last mountain bird observatory is very important for the uh, bird to Saskatchewan as well. I was just a follow up. The person was asking the, the bird again. It's a, a ferruginous hawk that Al said was his favorite. Um, yeah, yeah. Through the raptors, if you find that one. Oh, tell us about some of the northern and southern places that I've gone to track birds. Well, when I went, went up north, I went to the Mackenzie Delta. And if you go to the museum here in Regina, or I'm in the Avenue, but near Regina, you'll see a diorama of the Mackenzie Delta. And uh, it's very accurate. And it transported me back there when I saw it. Anyway. The Mackenzie Delta is a very important area because it's a super tundra. It's got so many shorebirds in there. Uh, it's, it's alive with shorebirds. So places like that, uh, like the Mackenzie Delta, are so important because they're quite uh, rare. Most of the Arctic is uh, dry desert country. So when you get a delta, it's so rich that it's very important that those areas be conserved because they are very important. Uh, places for breeding shorebirds and things like you know Lapland longspurs and and uh, other northern birds. And in south, I, I went to actually banded in the mangroves in Costa Rica, and the mangroves are really interesting because um, they are the uh, places where uh, um, the shrimp are born and. Unfortunately, um, they actually, and ironically, they clear the mangroves to grow shrimp farms. But the problem with shrimp is that the, 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 the larvae only occur in mangroves. So you're kind of destroying the very thing you're trying to produce is by destroying the mangroves. Mangroves are so important. They protect the ocean from, um, uh, the wave action and back in when they had the big tsunami in uh, Thailand, coastal places that had their mangroves were not hardly touched compared to the areas where they had cleared the mangroves for shrimp farms and for uh, uh, recreation or, and what have you. So um, it's so important to uh, conserve mangroves because they are so uh, important for the coastal areas and for certain birds. So uh, when you buy shrimp, try to buy shrimp that are grown uh, uh, in a sustainable fashion. I saw a question here about, uh, have I caught any birds that were banded elsewhere? Yep. I think that was a question. Yep. Um, uh, yes, I uh, caught a yellow warbler from uh, Beaver Hill Bird Observatory at Last Mountain Bird Observatory. So obviously, uh, you know, when you think about where Edmonton is relative to Last Mountain Bird Observatory, it's more west than north. In fact, uh, most of the birds that we've had recoveries of that we've banded here at Last Mountain Bird Observatory have been recovered recovered in Ontario. So there's a real strong uh, uh, southeastern component of migration before they, uh, so they kind of go more southeast towards Ontario and then south again. So, you know, that's where banding helps and uh, um, we need uh, more, uh, uh, more technology to figure this out, I guess. Anybody else that would like to still put in a question to Al?
Yeah, just to uh, see if anyone else has a question or not. Uh, okay, yeah, there's a couple more now that have come up. Um, which birds have the longest migratory path? In the world? Yeah, mm -hmm. just, uh, yeah, I guess that would be the question. It doesn't specify. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of long distance champions that uh, occur like uh, Hudsonian Goddard, which breeds in the Mackenzie Delta and winters in Tierra del Fuego. So it basically goes the whole length of the uh, Americas. Um, I think the champion is the, uh, could be the uh, uh, Bartailed Goddard, could be one of the champions going from Alaska to New Zealand. Um, most of it over open ocean. That could be another uh, champion. There's only one bird that nests in Saskatchewan and occurs in the antipodes of Saskatchewan. And what's the antipodes? Well, you drill the hole right through the earth, where would you come out from Saskatchewan? You come out in the southern Indian Ocean. And there's only one bird species that occurs in both places. And that is the Arctic tern, which is the bird that sees most sunlight of any bird in, in the world because it basically breeds in the Arctic in the summer and occurs in the Antarctic or sub-Antarctic in the winter. So it never really sees darkness. Uh, somebody's asking when uh, the banding starts in the spring and the fall. Well, we start on... Uh, Official dates are May 9th to May 31st in the spring and from um, September 5th to uh, uh, October uh, 7th in the fall. One of the things that has happened though is that we think some of these birds are coming back earlier in the spring. So it begs the question, should we start banding earlier in the spring? And that, uh, that question I'll leave to my statistical friends, whether or not, because you want to keep consistent. You want to have the, the nets open the same time frame from one year to the next. But if you've got a moving target due to climate change, that mm -hmm. really raises a, a question that, you know, I'm not sure I can answer because, you know, you, you, we may be getting, we, the birds may be shifting out of our window. I know in the fall, I'm, I think what's happened is that with the tree sparrow, the American tree sparrow, we used to catch all kinds of them in the fall, in the late September, early October. We hardly catch any anymore. So what's happening? Well, you can have two questions or two answers to that question. Answer one is that the tree sparrow is migrating later. And so we're not really banding them because we don't ban far enough to catch them now because they're migrating too later. Or their numbers may be declining. And so, um, again, uh, you know, we are limited by, you know, how much money we can spend and, you know, you know, maybe we should be going earlier in the spring and later in the fall to capture these changes. So that's one reason we want to look at phenology. Is it changing? Mm -hmm. um, do birds that nest here and migrate have another uh, nesting season in the southern places they migrate to? Well, you know, this, this uh, is interesting because uh, um, the only bird that I know of that does this is the burrowing owl. And it's been documented that a burrowing owl will nest in Saskatchewan and nest again further south. But what we don't, what we don't know about birds is, is that this could be more common than we think. We know, for instance, that uh, when birds migrate, they do some things that we'd never really dreamt of. For instance, lazuli buntings, which nest in Saskatchewan, the lazuli bunting um, migrates to uh, south, uh, to uh, western Mexico and molts. And then after it molts, it goes to another winter, to the wintering area. So when we look at birds, we have to be more conscious of the fact that they might have more than just A to B. They might have A, B, C, D. And the more we find, study birds, the more we find out that they do a lot of 
interesting things that we have no idea what happened. A good example of this is the uh, the surf scoter. By looking, putting radio telemetry tags on surf scoters, we found out that this bird goes from the Puget Sound of Washington, the male goes to the female, to northern Saskatchewan, he, he mates with her, and as ducks tend to do, excuse me, the male takes off after he's had his way with her, and he goes north to the Beaufort Sea, flies around all the way around Alaska, and then back to Puget Sound. We had no idea that this bird did this until we did telemetry. So the the idea that birds go from A to B is being exploded because the more we study, the more we know that they do some things that we totally did not expect. Just as we're beginning to find out that female birds sing as well as male birds. Mm. And it's only because women have said, hey, wait a minute, we're finding out that female birds are singing. What's wrong with you guys? You think the only males can sing, you know? <laughs> not true. About uh, yeah, more more yeah. It may not be as common as uh, as with uh, with males, but it does occur. Uh, do songbirds and raptors share migration routes, or do they avoid each other's routes? Um, well, raptors raptors are interesting because at least during raptors, like hawks and falcons. They fly, um, they like to fly during the day and they like to use a thermals from heating to migrate. Also, they don't like to fly over water. In fact, excuse me a second here. All the sweets and hawks in North America go through the Isthmus of Panama because they, they hate to fly over, over water. Now who's the wimp? The songbirds fly at night and they fly over water, no problem. So the, there's a total, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's no overlap between the two. Has the meadowlark population decreased? Yes, yeah. Um, in the birds of Saskatchewan, we have uh, at, under each species we have a listing of what what the decline or increase has been according to the BVS, and they have yes, in declined. I forget <coughs> by how much, but they have declined a lot since the BVS has been recording birds in Saskatchewan since 1967. Uh, that's all the questions that are on there right now. We'll just give it a second again and see if somebody else has one. Okay. Stretch here. Hi, Ed. Oh, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Al? Anything else about LMBO or any future direction you see for it? Well, I, I'm pretty excited about this MOTUS. Um, for those people who want to read up about it, because I have very poorly explanation for that, it's M-O-T-U-S. So check that on the, on the internet. But it has a lot of promise. Maybe I'll just add for everyone's benefit that we uh, we are getting in, involved in MODIS as Al describes, and we uh, we actually have a receiving station ready to go and yeah. install at LMBO, and uh, we're going to look at uh, seeing if we can uh, be involved in putting other receiving stations for that network along the flyway. So certainly something that Nature Sask wants to get uh, further involved in as a new kind of monitoring. No, I just thank everybody for the opportunity to uh, speak to them tonight and for the opportunity to be a part of the Daniel Station for 
a good chunk of my life and to see um, people like Jordan Chambers, Jordan Rustad Chambers and uh, Emily Donstetter um, take over the reins and, and uh, carry on because, you know, like I say, it's going to be a, a long-term thing uh, to get some of the answers. We're going to have to spend more time and more money and hopefully we can influence uh, management, management of birds in, in the province and in Canada. Well, I think on behalf of the Nature Saskatchewan family, uh, I can thank you as well, Al, for everything you've done for LMBO over the years. It's just a magnificent effort and uh, wouldn't be there like that without you, I'm sure. So well, thanks, thanks very much. Well, thank you for having me on and for uh, all the support you've given uh, the Bird Observatory over the years and uh, yeah. Look, look forward to another 30 years, eh? Excellent, yeah. yeah. Well, and thanks very much for the talk this evening, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us this evening as well. We're really glad you could attend.